Uh, thanks, Colleen, and you can hear me well? Nice and clear, Russell, thank you. Great, thank you so much, everybody, for attending today. And as Colleen mentioned, our apologies for the little glitch. But uh, I'll take you through a number of slides, about 12 slides that explain the project. But first, I would like to acknowledge that this meeting is being hosted virtually on the unceded traditional territory of the Comox First Nation, the traditional keepers of the land. Again, thank you for participating. These plans are made successful by the participation of the community, and I really appreciate that you're here today as well as those residents that attended our public open houses, because your input will be considered by the project team when considering all aspects of the traffic and construction of this project. The need of the project and the environmental risk. This conveyance project will replace the pipes and upgrade the pump stations that move more than 14,000 cubic meters of raw sewage each day to the sewage treatment plant on Brent Road. That's almost six Olympic-sized swimming pools. Currently, the forest mains run untreated wastewater near or on the foreshore. The project is urgently needed to protect the beaches and waters throughout the Comox Valley Estuary, Point Homes, Goose Spit coastline, as well as Bain Sound. The new system will route sewer pipes further inland where they will no longer be vulnerable to storm damage by waves, rocks, and logs. Construction is expected to begin in the summer of 2023 and should last between 18 and 24 months. This presentation will walk through the construction, traffic, and archaeological impacts to seven key zones. I'll get you just to move on to slide number two, please, Colleen. As depicted on this slide, these zones along the project route, which starts at the new Courtney pump station, a new sewer pipe will be constructed using traditional trenching along Comox Road. That's when you see machines dig a, a trench and apply the pipe and backfill. That will happen through the Comox First Nation land, downtown Comox, and then the pipe will be tunneled through Lazo Hill to the sewage treatment plant on Brent Road. Construction will occur along some of the Comox Valley's busiest roads, impacting anyone who lives, works, or travels to and from this area. This is a complex undertaking involving collaboration with many jurisdictions, including Comox First Nation, the town of Comox, and we have been working closely with key stakeholders, including the RCMP, Ambulance and Fire, the school district, transit, and local businesses to gather input and minimize the impacts where we can. All feedback, including what we have heard from the community throughout this engagement, these engagement sessions, will inform a traffic management strategy. This is under development and will be shared with the public in early 2023. Next slide, please. Working collaboratively with Comox First Nation, we have established an important relationship. In February of 2021, that included the signing of a community benefit agreement. We have been working with Comox and archaeologists to identify sensitive areas along the entire route. A mitigation plan has been developed. It is a cultural heritage impacts mitigation report. We have received archaeological permits from the Comox First Nation as well as the province. And what we will be undertaking as part of this work, archaeological investigation, including pre-digging portions of the proposed route through IR number one. The mitigation measures also include the place of identified archaeological sites found during investigation. And there will be a monitor throughout the entire project along the route. Next slide, please. The Courtney pump station will be rebuilt and relocated, and there will be upgrades to the Comox pump station. Archaeological work will include before construction starts to better understand the extent of materials along the route. A temporary bypass line will be established through IR number one, where we will be installing the proposed route in the existing trench to, un to avoid disturbance to the material. This will require a temporary bypass line to be installed along the section of the Comox Road while the old force main is removed to make way for the new pipe. This bypass will be visible for approximately two to four months, but is only a temporary measure. Sections of the new force main will be rerouted off Comox Road to avoid archeological sensitive zones. 
Therefore, single lane traffic throughout this area with rolling closures will experience on parts of Farmview Road and Scott Road with access to local traffic only. Detour routes for the area will be along Anderton, Guthrie, Lurwick and Ryan Road. Back Road will not be available as a detour route and traffic calming measures will be undertaken. Next slide, please. On the Comox Hill and Comox Avenue construction area, we will see a new odor control structure at the top of Comox Hill between Glacier View Drive and Comox Avenue. It is proposed that two new roundabouts will be constructed in this portion of construction by the town of Comox. These will be discussed in a little bit more detail later on in the presentation. Throughout construction, single lane traffic will be experienced on Comox Hill and along Comox Avenue west of Rodello. It's possible that night work might be experienced on Comox Hill to prevent daytime road closures and shorten the overall time of construction. Detour routes for this portion of the project will continue to be Anderton, Guthrie, Lurwick, and Ryan Road. Next slide, please. The new pipe will be routed off Comox Avenue between Rodella and Stewart to Beaufort Avenue. The town of Comox will undertake various improvements through this construction. And again, we will discuss those improvements in a little more detail later on. For the sewage system, this will include upgrades to the Comox pump station at Jane Place. In terms of traffic mitigation, we'll see rolling full block or two block closures along Beaufort Avenue and Stewart Street. Full closures with some single lane traffic along Balmoral Avenue and sections on Torrance Road. Detour routes will be provided for vehicles, bikes, and pedestrians that would normally park or travel along closed sections of Beaufort and will be detoured to Comox Avenue. We understand the need for marina access throughout the project. No impacts will be realized during the summer months and construction will be paused during nautical days to avoid any disruption. Steps will be taken to protect and preserve the trees along Balmoral Avenue an important consideration that we heard from residents during our earlier consultation sessions. Next slide, please. I've mentioned a number of street improvements proposed by the Town of Comox. An agreement has been struck between the CVRD and the Town of Comox to include key town upgrades as part of the sewer conveyance construction. This will reduce the overall disruption to residents. Could you imagine if we did the sewer project and then months later you waited for the roads to be finalized and undertaken in a separate project? The town has been very instrumental in bringing us together to see that these projects will occur at the same time to, to diminish the disruption that will happen to the community and to see these projects succeed over the term of the duration of this construction. The five projects include Glacier View Drive and Comox Avenue Roundabout, a Rodello Street and Comox Avenue roundabout. Beaufort Avenue improvement includes upgrades along Beaufort, which will happen between Norden and Church Street. This includes the sidewalk on both sides of the road, formalized parking areas, and a shared bike lane vehicle lane. On Balmoral Avenue, improvements will include a new sidewalk on the south side of Balmoral Avenue from Stewart Street to Pritchard Road, and a new bus shelter at existing bus stops. Balmoral Avenue to Torrance Road improvements will include the repaving of Balmoral and Torrance Road. Town of Comox staff are working with us to finalize these details and are part of the panel today to answer any questions you might have about these particular upgrades. I wish to commend the staff of the Town of Comox, as well as the Sewage Commission and the Town Council itself for coming together to realize these improvements for your community. Slide number eight, please. The Lazo area construction includes a tunnel pipe from Torrance and Lazo Road to the existing right-of-way at Moreland Road. Tunneling uses a route that reduces impacts on culturally sensitive areas. A minimum of 20 meter offset will be provided from any deep water wells within the vicinity of the proposed conveyance line. The chosen route impacts the fewest private properties and reduces neighborhood disruption. Reducing the impact to Lazo Marsh will be realized by eliminating that portion of the tunnel. Minimal traffic impacts are expected on Lazo Road, but expect some disruption along Moreland Road and to some of the walking trails in the area. These disruptions will be communicated to you in plenty of time before construction. 
construction. Next slide, please. Horiz horizontal directional drilling is the methodology used to tunnel the pipe. It will be used to avoid surface impacts through Lazo Hill. Contractors use a drill rig to horizontally drill an underground pathway for the new pipe between an entry and an exit pit. This, pro pro this process happens in three stages as illustrated by these diagrams. The first is to create the pilot borehole. Then a reaming pass is made to make the tunnel consistent in the right circumference to accept the pipe. The pipe is then pulled back, pre-assembled and pulled back through the tunnel. Next slide, please. It is important to note that this portion of the conveyance line will be gravity fed. Non-pressurized flow virtually eliminates any already very low risk of a leak. A pipe that is not under pressure is not subject to those uh, dramatic break or catastrophic event that would be realized when a pipe is under extreme pressure, such that we would realize if it was practical even to cut and cover this along the roadways. This allows the route, this methodology allows the route to remain 10 meters above the aquifer, eliminating the penetration of the aquifer by the pipe, its installation or the construction itself. The pipe wall is designed to withstand installation stress far exceeding the zero pressure of operational flow. Next slide, please. The total project is anticipated to cost $101 million with an estimated 80 year service life for the new pipe. This is an increase from the initial project estimate of 73 million that we provided in June of 2021, when we went to the alternative approval process for the long-term borrowing of the $52 million required to fund the project at the time. But since then, market conditions have changed substantially and general inflation and increases to fuel, material prices have had a significant impact on the project budget. However, the project can proceed. We have the ability to meet this $101 million cost through long our long-term borrowing as authorized previously and short-term borrowing. But in the spring, once contracts are awarded and costs are confirmed, we will seek approval to utilize the maximum amount of long-term borrowing for the project to secure $68.7 million of a loan. Spreading the payment schedule out over a longer term reduces an annual payment amounts and improves the affordability of this project for homeowners but it is required through the Local Government Act that long-term borrowing be approved by this process. Using current interest rates, the cost per household is now estimated at $240 per year for 30 years. More information about this process will be forthcoming in the spring of 2023. And now my final slide. In terms of the timeline, we will be collating the feedback from the public open houses and starting to prepare for construction between now and the end of 2022. In early 2023, we will finalize construction and management plans. And as mentioned, those management plan, traffic management plans will be public. We anticipated in the spring of 2023, the alternative approval process and more how open houses to share the information necessary with you, the public. In the summer of 2023, it's expected that construction will start with 18 to 24 months being required to fulfill the requirements of this project. In closing, I wanna thank you very much for your time and I'll pass it back to Colleen who will facilitate the question period. Please take this opportunity to ask your questions through the chat and we'll do our best to answer them now or over the next few weeks. Also, as Colleen mentioned, because this is on Zoom, it is recorded, we will make it available from our website. So please encourage those that are not able to attend this or our public open houses to please watch and send us your questions. We look forward to your questions and thank you for your time today. Great, thank you Russell for that overview. Um, lots of really good information and I see a few questions have already come in that we will be able to dive into momentarily. I just wanna remind a few people who've joined since we have kicked off if you want to share a question today, you can click on the little Q&A box at the bottom black bar of your Zoom screen and type your question in there. That's how we'll be collecting them and presenting them to the panelists. You can post it anonymously by clicking on the but checkbox beside it, or you can upvote other people's questions if it's already being presented there because you can see uh, the list that's coming together. 
So the first question uh, today came up back actually early in the presentation around slide four when we were talking about Comox Road and KFN lands. Uh, and it was asking what kind of monitor would be used along that route. So uh, perhaps somebody can um, help explain a little bit more about what that monitoring process looks like um, around the archaeologically um, sensitive areas. Sure, I can speak to that, Colleen. Can you hear me? I can hear you great. Thanks, Chris. Okay, great. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so yeah, under under our commitments um, to both the province and the Comox First Nation, um, we will have a construction monitor in place at every piece of digging equipment um, along the project alignment. So in the Comox Road area and uh, and along the rest of the alignment. Um, and that will either be a Comox band member or somebody appointed by the by the Comox. Um, and the purpose will be to, um, to, to to closely observe the material being excavated um, and uh, and to you know, call a pause if any uh, sensitive materials are seen so that um, so that the right protocols can be followed to ensure that uh, um, the project isn't uh, doing any further uh, impact to sensitive archaeological materials. You're, you're on mute. Thank you. The classic Zoom line. Um, so, sorry, the next question goes into more specifics about the roundabouts uh, that have been introduced for the town of Comox. So I'm hoping somebody can maybe explain a little bit more about what the size of those roundabouts uh, will be. Yeah, I can go into that question. Um, so the, the two roundabouts are of varying sizes. The roundabout that's at Rodello is going to be similar to the size of a roundabout that we have at, uh, at Pritchard and Knight Road, the existing roundabout up by the airport. So fairly, fairly large size. Um, we have dealt with the property acquisition and are, are in the process of dealing with the property acquisition. Um, when the hospital redevelopment was going on, we were able to negotiate with the developer to get a large swath of the, the land is, that is required for the roundabout. So we've we've dealt with that aspect and there's some some minor stuff that are minor additional areas that we're dealing with with private landowners at this point. Uh, the roundabout at Glacier View is going to be much smaller. Uh, however, it is uh, the first stage in a, a larger roundabout or a more detailed roundabout that we're going to get into in the future. Um, we're looking at a, a roundabout that's dealing solely with Glacier View and Comox right now, just to help with traffic getting off of Glacier View Drive. Um, and we're looking at uh, intersection turning restrictions at Aiken so that we allow people to turn right out off of Aiken, go around the roundabout and be able to go back towards Comox in that area just to, to stop people backing up and uh, causing traffic delays for, for people turning left off of Aiken. Uh, however, we will still be allowing a left turn off of Comox Ave onto Aiken in a dedicated left turn lane. The future roundabout that we're looking at would be adding in a, a complementary roundabout um, the engineers call it a dog bone because uh, it looks kind of like a dog bone or a dumbbell where it's essentially two roundabouts paired together. Um, it restricts the movement within the center of the roundabout but allows full movement around the outside. Um, the engineers that we are, are working with are experts in these fields and it is um, this is a roundabout that they've put in in other locations and has worked extremely well. Great. That kind of leads us into another question, actually, Craig. That uh, so maybe you've already touched. You've already touched a little bit on it, but yep. just to hit it uh, directly, the question is kind of why the decision to put those two roundabouts in a relatively close proximity to each other, and and what the decision making process is uh, behind that. Yeah. So these two roundabouts have actually been part of the town's uh, transportation plan since we completed a, a transportation master plan in 2011. Uh, both of these intersections have been at a limited level of service and a failing level of service for a long time. Um, so the reason that the, the two of them need to be put together, uh, and th there's about a, almost 500 meter separation between them, so there is still a, a fairly good separation between them, uh, but they are dealing with two separate issues. Uh, 
the intersection at Rodello, um, we are dealing with people trying to get out of the, the neighboring subdivisions. Um, and we are doing the same at Glacier View. However, there's there's really no way, there is no way to, no easy way to link the two together, uh, short of putting people through existing residential neighborhoods. Um, so the idea of having the two separate ones deals with two separate traffic issues at the end of the day. Um, as I said, it was identified in the 2011 transportation study, and it was reestablished and reconfirmed in our recent 2020 uh, traffic master plan update as well. Uh, so it, it has been reaffirmed recently in terms of the need for, for both roundabout, roundabouts. Great. Thank you, Craig. Um, this question goes back uh, probably to Russell and Chris. Uh, and it popped in uh, when we were talking about the tunneling process around Lazo. Um, and so the question is, how was the 20 meter offset um, established or selected as a as a process there? And, and where did that advice for the distance come from? Sure, I can speak to that one. Uh, so we worked, we've worked closely uh, over the entire duration of the project with our um, hydrological engineers, uh, advisors at uh, GW Solutions. Uh, so we worked closely with them on this specific piece um, to look at, uh, and so some of the considerations that they um, that they considered when developing that minimum distance were the um, the nature of the ground in that area. We've done a number of of boreholes in the area, so we've got a very good sense of the of the ground conditions found down at that significant depth where the pipe will be running, um, which is you know, approximately 25 meters from much of that alignment. Uh, so it's highly, highly dense, highly compacted sand. Um, and so the, that those those ground conditions were, were a key input. So they they did undertook took modeling. So computer modeling um, with those, those ground parameters input um, to determine the rate of travel um, from a hypothetical leak in the extremely unlikely event that a leak were to occur, how quickly that um, that wastewater would propagate through that those specific ground conditions, and that was a key um, a, a key input to to that determination of the of the distance. Um, the to, just to put that in pr to perspective, the um, so the twenty meter horizontal distance over to the closest well, well, so that's the minimum distance. And, and then the other key parameter is the distance from the um, hypothetically leaking pipe and the, the top of, of the groundwater in the, in the aquifer, which as Russell mentioned, is a minimum of 10 meters from the pipe down to, that, uh, down to the aquifer. Uh, so those two, those two key distances, um, using those and in combination with the modeling and the ground conditions, they concluded that um, you know that it would take months for um, for leaking wastewater to travel that that distance, um, and that provided us the, the assurance necessary to set that minimum. That being said, um, while we did set a minimum of twenty meters, um, we're over a minimum of twenty five from the closest um, well to the to the pipe. Great, thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions coming up about um, traffic management and transportation during the construction piece. So the first one is about biking. Will there be an alternate bike group established uh, to replace um, the loss of Comox Avenue during the work? <clears throat> sure, I can speak to, to that one. So um, we're, we're in the, the, the process of uh, finalizing our traffic management strategy that we've been working on um, with Urban Systems, our, um, our consultant, as well as uh, key stakeholder groups and project partners uh, since early summer. Um, and our intent is to um, constrain or within that, that document, the um, provision of, of two-way bike um, access along Comox Road uh, during delivery of the, of the project. Um, so that, that is our intention. We 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 don't want the the project to to um, to interfere with the the established routine of those that have have um, have switched from from driving to 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 bike commuting. Um, so we're we're still working on exactly what that will look like, but that's our intention now is to is to guarantee that two way bike uh, traffic over the duration of the project. Great. 
And then speaking of that uh, traffic management strategy, the next question is asking if there, if you can provide any more detail about how traffic is going to be managed during daytime construction, in particular, considering people who are trying to get uh, to work and to businesses uh, through through the area. Um, can you expand on that a bit, Chris? Sure. Um, so as I, as I mentioned, we're still working on finalizing the traffic management strategy. Uh, but what we what we know at this point is that there will be um, single lane traffic uh, for um, significant chunks of time during the overall project delivery window. Um, so the, the the construction itself will be you know roughly eighteen, potentially up to as twenty twenty months starting next summer. Um, so it's important to note though that uh, that's the the total construction duration. We expect the um, the specific sections of Comox Road that will be, or any any road along the alignment uh, to be on the order of months, you know, uh, you know several months to the, the longest section being from Bayside Road to to Rodello. That section might be on the order of nine months. Um, so we're not looking at the full eighteen to twenty month delay uh, on any one section of 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 roadway. Um, it, it, in, in many areas, will be significantly less than that. Okay, switching gears a little bit again in the questions. So this one is about the planning for the system. Will will the um, upgrades include kind of room for population growth in the region? Um, and if so, kind of forecasting out for how long? Sure. Yeah. So that's that's a you know it's a it's a critical piece of 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 any infrastructure large infrastructure planning is to ensure that. Um, you know, that it's being built to, to handle projected growth. Um, and it's typically tied to the lifespan of the infrastructure in question. So the key, you know, the, the, the biggest piece of, of this project is definitely the force main, uh, the new the new line that will convey Courtney and Comox wastewater to the treatment plant. Um, and so that that's being built out of uh, HDPE or high density poly polyethylene. Which has a, a, a kind of a sticker life of, of 80 years. Um, so the the population and, and wastewater flow projections developed for the to, to help size that that pipe um, look out that 80 years to approximately 2100. What, what the you know the size of the community and the projected wastewater flows at that at that point in time. Okay. Great. And then um, looking back to kind of next steps for the project. So the question is just confirming that um, the update in the timeline was there would be a second AAP coming um, in spring 2023. I believe that does line up with what the timeline ahead is, but maybe um, Russell or Chris, you guys can just um, confirm that with next steps uh, on the financial planning side for this. Yeah, sure. I can I can speak to that. Um, so we're still working out the details in terms of the precise delivery or timing of the AAP. But um, but like you indicated, or the question acknowledged, uh, we're looking at approximately the second quarter of of next year for the timing for that um, for that second AAP. Okay. Perfect. Um, and then a question about uh, Jane Place specifically in the traffic impacts in that area. Do we have any more information about how uh, traffic will be managed um, around uh, that specific neighborhood? Sure. Yeah, that's. I can. I can definitely understand the question. It's a very narrow roadway coming up from the lower part of Jane Place up to the connection or intersection with Beaufort. Um, so. The fortunately, though, the um, the area of disruption on Jane Place will be just from the pump station up to Beaufort. So it's a relatively short, um, short section of new pipe that has to be installed and, and a relatively short section of, of Jane Place that needs to be impacted. Um, so that that, you know, that that touches on the kind of the relatively short duration of that work. But um, but we'll be working with our contractors to ensure local access uh, for the duration of that of that construction um, potentially with the exception of you know several hours here or there but that would be but those would be uh, communicated well in advance you know on the on the order of two weeks in advance of of uh, a temporary shutdown on the on the uh, 
on the order of, of hours. And even during that shutdown, the contractor would have to have provision in place to allow uh, emergency vehicle access down to, to Jane Place at a moment's notice. Um, so that's what I can say now. And we'll know more about um, you know the, the duration and timing of that piece of work once we get into next year and we start to see the traffic management plans from the contractors. Okay, great. Um, the next question kind of touches again on the increase in capacity in the forward planning that I think you've already touched on, Chris, but has a second part to it, which asks whether developers have contribution, make contributions to the cost to help defer um, kind of those future uh, expansion needs um, moving forward. Sure, yeah, I can speak to, to that. So the, 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 the sewage service has a, um, a development cost charge bylaw in place. Uh, um, as well as a capital improvement cost charge. Well, so those are two mechanisms. Um, they're, they're, they're actually an, an equivalent um, charge per new unit um, of development. Um, and so for the uh, sewer service, the, the, almost the entire service area falls within the municipalities. So it, these are uh, charges that are administered by uh, the respective municipalities and collected um, at the point of a subdivision or, or creation, rezoning or creation of new units or, or lots within both municipalities. And so each one of those pays the, pays the DCC rate. Um, and over time, that adds up significantly. So over the past several years, as we've seen development increase within the community, uh, so, so has this revenue um, coming in to help fund uh, the growth component of of future upgrades, and so just you know, you know, in a nutshell, we we work to to to, to kind of update and maintain those charges based on the uh, the projects that are on the horizon for the service, um, and and it's the the charge that's levied against those new units is is proportional to um, the number of projects that we that we are forecasting for the service. So um, so that uh, development cost charge, uh, those that revenue goes into a reserve. And was instrumental in um, in helping us to achieve the kind of minimize the borrowing required for this uh, for this project. Great. Um, circling back to the archaeological investigation work that we kicked off the Q and A with, there's a follow up question just asking whether or not that investigation continues um, through the entire construction project. Um, I'm guessing that's along the entire route um, or throughout the the full period of work. So, sorry, was Colleen, was that regarding the monitoring? Uh, yeah, ar yeah, archaeological investigation. Investigation, okay. Yeah. Yeah. So the the investigation um, is definitely front end heavy. So we've we're um, it's something that we're embarking on over the over the coming weeks. Um, our phase one investigations where we'll be. Um, doing some minimally intrusive um, explorations along the route to help us better determine you know where we're likely to encounter um, sections of significant uh, archaeological significance um, and then depending on the results of, of, of that phase one investigation we may do uh, go into a phase two investigation and all of this is occurring prior to construction um, and the purpose of the phase two would be to follow up on on some of the phase one results to see um, to, to to take a closer look at areas that that were flagged by that first piece of work. Um, and then the intention is to be, between those two sets of investigations to to really um, remove most or if not all of the uncertainty about where materials will be encountered during construction. But uh, but then back to my my previous comments about monitoring. So that that is something that will be um, present for the entire length of the project. So that monitor um, either KF and band members or or um, or somebody uh, appointed by the by the COMOX who will be present at that at, at each piece of machinery, um, spotting for any um, under you know, any any materials of archaeological significance. And again, that's for the entire duration of the project. Right. Um, and then another question that was about the capacity piece that we've touched on, but also whether or not, just wanting to confirm whether or not access to Emerald Shores will be maintained throughout the construction uh, period. 
Yep. So, um, so, so the answer, the answer is, is yes. Um, there's a, there'll be a requirement on the, on the contractors, um, to guarantee access to all driveways over the duration of the project, so it'll be it'll be part of the constraint um, that each of the contractors is uh, is faced with with navigating. But yes, definitely access to Emerald Shores for the duration of the project, with the exception of potentially uh, you know several hours here and there, uh, which would be um, which would be for which the residents would be provided significant advance notice. Great. Um, the next question is about noise from the construction work and whether or not there's a sense of what the geographical area will be that will be impacted by noise from this work. Uh, the attendee is asking specifically about the Lazo area and of how far uh, the work will be heard. Yeah, so I guess the, the Lazo, so I mean, in terms of the geographical area, the, the entire project alignment activity along that al entire alignment will generate uh, noise. Um, we are um, we are we are looking at um, at providing the potential for the contractors to work at night on a couple sections along Comox Road, um, where um, just in order to be able to to guarantee that uh, single lane traffic within the daytime, um, but but not in areas that are that are too close to to to, uh, to residences. Um, in terms of the Lazo Hill area, uh, the the use of the tunneling. Um, Technology will will definitely reduce um, noise in that area as a as a, as a secondary benefit, um, with the exception of the operation at either end of the of the tunneling, um, which will be uh, you know there, there will that will generate some noise um, during 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 business hours and potentially a, a little bit outside um, during the pullback, which is a um, a two day three period two or three day period. Where the pipe is pulled back through the um, through the hill. Okay, thank you. Um, this question might be Chris, and but Craig, you might want to weigh in on this one as well. And it asks whether or not there's any considerations to improving or upgrading lights um, at the downtown Comox Avenue four-way stop signs. So a little bit separate from this project, but um, maybe close. In connection. Great, you um, want to take this one? <laughs> I could take it, yeah. Um, so no, there's no no plans for any upgrades through uh, to the lights or to the intersections in in downtown Comox. Um, they haven't been identified in any of the master plans to date, and it's it's not something that's being seen as as a necessary upgrade at this point. Okay, thank you. Um, and then Chris, I'll go back to you with this one, which is a question about what is the seismic resilience that's being built into the force main um, system as part of the design work? So, yeah, so the um, the seismic, the, the modern seismic standards are a key driver for the upgrades or replacement, replacement of the Courtney pump station. So, um, uh, and, the, and the force main. So there'll be a combination of of standards um, between the two thousand the two thousand four hundred and seventy five year return for the pump station and force main and the uh, one in about nine hundred and seventy five I believe year return um, seismic event for the bulk of the force main. Okay, great. I have a series of questions that kind of speak specifically to kind of paving and sections that will work that will be um, under construction. So the first one is about the sidewalk on Belmoral and whether or not the power poles will be moved to make room for that sidewalk or whether the sidewalk will be um, created in the current road area. So the design as it sits right now um, is that the new sidewalk will be built onto the exist existing asphalt area. Um, we have designed around the existing power poles and there's no plan to to put those underground or or relocate them at this time perfect and then maybe kind of a secondary to that this is for beaufort avenue whether there's any talk about um undergrounding the power telephone um lines as the force main is being installed as part of this work so we are still working on that one. Uh, we haven't made a, a final decision uh, on that point. We are looking at both options as it sits right now. 
Um, unfortunately, it's extremely expensive to, to put overhead hydro underground. Um, so we, we do have a, a design going forward uh, and we we're actually paralleling both options at this point and we're planning on going to council shortly with, with that ultimate decision. Great. And then on Torrance Road, will the full road be repaved or just the section between Balmoral and Lazo um, that is part of the route? So as part of the project, we have uh, requested that the CBRD install a, a sanitary line for future development that goes up north of Lazo Road all the way up to Albatross Road. So we will be paving uh, the town side of the road from Albatross all the way down to Balmoral. Okay. Um, and then a roundabout question. So the question is specifically around kind of larger delivery trucks or larger vehicles. Would they will they still be able to navigate um, these roundabouts, um, particularly the one that's smaller in size? Yep. So we do, uh, as part of the roundabout design, we do make sure to look at a, a large semi trailer uh, as being able to get through the roundabout. So when we do, when we design them, we make sure to look at the largest vehicles that are, are in the area, uh, and we definitely accommodate those. Um, similar to what's at uh, the roundabout at Pritchard and Knight, there may be a, a return restriction for vehicles. Uh, for example, with that one, if they're coming from the airport, they actually have to go all the way around the, the roundabout to go north on Military Row. Um, so I believe that we do have that as well for certain turning movements uh, at the roundabout at Rodello. However, the one at Glacier View, we don't have any of those restrictions. Okay. Um, the next question is about the Glacier View Comox roundabout. The understanding from the attendee is that there was going to be funding for that from a development in the area. Is that still a part of the funding uh, for this work now? So we have looked at and we are using our development cost charge funding uh, for the Rodello roundabout. And because the we've limited and shrunk the size of the, the Glacier View roundabout, um, we are not touching our DCC uh, funding at this time. However, it would be used for any expansion in the future, which would be triggered with any redevelopment of the Harborwood area, uh, which is the area on Aiken, just north of Comox out. Okay, great. Um, the next question is about Aiken uh, and how what could be done to prevent um, it from becoming a cut through during the construction work? So, is there any discussion about kind of uh, planning or tools to help uh, mitigate that impact? I'll leave that one to you, Chris. <laughs> Um, yeah, I have to admit that one hasn't come up specifically. Um, we are looking at a potential detour for a, a limited period of time, um, which would cut up from Glacier View through Strathcona um, to get around the Glacier View Comox intersection um, for that for a very limited period of time, where the construction activity will be focused right on that area. And it might be challenging to 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 ensure the single lane traffic along Comox Avenue and um, to and from Glacier View. So there may be a temporary um, detour at that point, um, but otherwise um, we we aren't expecting that's the Aiken route to specifically attract any any detour traffic. Yeah, great. Um, the next question is. Um, a question, but maybe also a, a comment for consideration. So specifically for people who are trying to do travel planning to things like ferry terminals and airports, is there an option or is it being considered to have kind of live monitoring of traffic delays so that people can um, adapt their plans uh, to be able to reach destinations on time as they need to? Yeah, that, this is a, a a question or suggestion that came up actually at one of last week's open houses. Um, so we're just we're just chewing on that right now, just to to see if there isn't a, an opportunity for um, for some type of webcam type of of, a, of an approach. Um, but I will I will note, um, all, although that that um, our our strategy is very much still coming together. Um, we are focused on providing you know a, a full range of um, of uh, updates through a full range of, of, of media 
um, throughout the project and our objective, you know, with, with the objective being that, um, that, that everybody in the community understands exactly where to go and has, has their, you know, using their preferred means of media to find out exactly what the, the disruption or if any will be for that specific day. Um, so there's to, to reduce or eliminate any uncertainty about potential impacts. Great. Um, the next question is about the dike road piece of the work and if we know kind of when in the con the wider construction window that work would be done and how long that specific portion will take. Yeah, so we don't we don't have a good sense right now of when within the construction window that work or that that arterial route will be disrupted. Um, as I mentioned, you know, we're looking at an 18 to, to 20 month uh, construction window, um, which any any one kind of part of the of the alignment will only be impacted for a portion of, of that total duration. So on within on Comox Road or Dyke Road. Um, there are two kind of primary areas of, of disruption, one being at the west end uh, near the Courtney Pump Station, between the Courtney Pump Station and the bird viewing platform. Um, so that's only about 600 meters. So that section you know, is likely to take about two or three months maximum of, of single lane traffic there. And then the other section um, is the longer one that I mentioned for, from Bayside up through all the way to Rodello. Um, that section is likely to take... Um, significantly longer potentially on the order of nine or ten months um, with single lane traffic through that area um, we're you know we're working with our with our through the traffic management strategy strategy to understand you know whether we can um, constrain those two pieces to happen at the same time to avoid you know, prolonging the disruption to that area which i think is would be preferable so we're working on on that um, but yeah, otherwise I can't I can't provide any insight at this point uh, prior to receiving the traffic management plans from the contractors early next year as to exactly when those uh, disruptions are going to occur. Great, thank you. Um, I'm just recognizing that it's one o'clock, which was the kind of original time that we we're going to be wrapping up. I know every, all the panelists here are able to stay on for another 10 or 15 minutes to try and tackle some more questions, but there may be some of our attendees who have to spell off at this point. So I just want to share a screen quickly that has um, the the web address and an email and phone number so that if people have any additional questions that they want to um, follow up with, this is the place to do it. Um, and so if you have to go, uh, thank you so much for being here and we appreciate very much your time, but if you can stay, we will keep going with a few more questions uh, in over the next few minutes. So with that, uh, the next question is back to kind of the forecasting and capacity planning. Does the upgrades that are happening as part of the sewer conveyance project also consider uh, the Union Bay development or the potential growth um, and addition of that service uh, in the future? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that one. So yes, the um, the planning work has considered the potential for flows coming in from from area A um, for the in terms of the sizing of the pipe and the pump stations. Um, if if uh, if development you know if and when development proceeds in the south, um, as I, you know, as I mentioned, we we have a an eighty year uh, design horizon for the pipe. Um, and so at that at that 80 year, so roughly the 2100, um, should development occur you know, relatively rapidly in the south, um, the south flows would represent about 15% of the total system flows, so a, a relatively small fraction. Um, and uh, and so there is the potential if if the development occurs uh, um, at that at that rapid rate in the south, that the timing for you know. Um, Future replacement or, or upsizing of the of the new pipe could be accelerated by several years, um, but otherwise um, the the pipe is is being sized to to accommodate those flows. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is about Glacier View Drive um, and the concern about impact from this construction work on that area. So, is there a potential for Glacier Glacier View to to see kind of an increased amount of traffic and um, speed uh, through this construction area and forward? Is that 
I guess, is there is that something that's being considered as the traffic management plan is coming together? Yeah, yes, absolutely. Um, so this summer, as we um, as we really dug into um, into the start of the, the traffic developing this traffic management strategy, we um, we developed a survey that was distributed to a range of of stakeholders or users of the of the of the road network, um, as as well as we met directly with uh, with nine key stakeholder groups, um, and we did hear from a number of respondents that um, about concern about the about any increase of traffic along back road and, and glacier view which uh, which connect um and so we are looking um so working through this traffic management strategy process looking to work with urban systems to identify some um, mitigation measures um you know russell mentioned the potential for traffic calming mechanisms so we're looking at, uh, at all options to try and to ensure that um diverted traffic away you know tra traffic that's diverting away from um from Comox and Dyke Road uh, that it doesn't end up on on uh, on on back road and glacier view and exacerbate an already um kind of overloaded uh road network um and if I might add into that one we have done some some traffic investigation into that area and have implemented traffic calming in the past and we will continue to do so and monitor the traffic after the construction of the roundabout as well to see if there's any issues and if there's any follow-up that we as the town have to do to to calm traffic through there if necessary great thank you the next question is about whether or not there's any disruption to wastewater service for residences during the construction phase um yeah is there any yep. changes to how how that works while it's all being constructed? Uh, so, so none anticipated. Um, obviously, this is a major one of the biggest constraints on the on the construction project is the kind of integration of the new infrastructure to to the existing. Um, so it'll be the focus of much uh, already already has been and, and will continue to be the focus of a lot of work to uh, to ensure that uh, the final plan implemented um you know, mitigates any risk to, to to wastewater operations so our we've we've we very firmly anticipate um no disruption to wastewater services at any point during a uh, delivery of the, of the project great um some specific questions about materials for the next one so what is the size of the force main as in the diameter of it and is the entire the entire route um, using that hdpe um and what is the maximum pressure expected uh during operation it's kind of a three-pronged approach so let me know if i can repeat any of it for you sure yeah so the uh, hdpe will, is is consistent will be consistent along the entire route um the diameter is um the, the, the project has been delivered by two different contracts one is a it is a design build um which which is based you know as performance based as we can as we can make it um, which is to to um leverage one of the key benefits of that approach which is a um the ability to for contractors to innovate um so for that for that section um we expect the the pipe diameter to be around 32 inches um but it's possible that through work from um a db team that they may be able to demonstrate a, a, a um the merits for a, a one size down so yeah 30 to 32 inches um and then uh sim similar within the, the the town and as far as pressures go um the highest pressures will be between um courtney pump station and and bayside at the beginning of the the comox hill um and i maybe zoe berkey do you have a sense of the maximum pressures we might see in that section of pipeline yeah thanks chris we'll be we'll be kind of pumping to a maximum height of 50 meters or around 75 psi thank you thanks Louis. great thank you guys um we're down to kind of our last few questions so i'm going to kind of do that last call if anybody wants to add any other questions in here now would be a great time i'm also going to launch a quick poll just asking about how people heard about today's webinar if you can click on the answer before you head off uh, we'd appreciate it. it helps us know kind of how best to make sure people are informed about these moving forward um so then the last few questions um over to chris i guess the question is 
uh, will the new system, especially at the top of Comox Hill, will the line be kind of in parallel, running in parallel basically to the existing sewage system in that area? Uh, so the ex the existing regional conveyance system runs um, well, leaves leaves land um, after coming down Bayside uh, through KFN IR one, and then the rest of the way follows the intertidal zone. Um, so we're, we're we're diverging from that line at the at the intersection of Bayside and Comox, uh, and so for the rest of the alignment from there to the plant, we won't be in parallel with with the existing pipe at all. Um, but maybe the question might be more about um, in parallel with other utilities. So, um, yeah, so that's a major a major uh, focus of analysis and uh, and planning has been how to how to navigate uh, the town streets and 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 get this pipe uh, through an already kind of cluttered subsurface in terms of utilities. We've got um, storm uh, sanitary storms. Uh, sorry, town sanitary. Town storm, um, water lines, you know, telecommunications, gas, all of that within the streets um, that we're navigating our, our way through as we as we cross the three and a half kilometers of of um, town of Comox streets between um, either side. Great, thank you. Um, is there a way that local small businesses can get involved in the project as subcontractors? That's a good question. I think, um, you know, the, so as I mentioned, the, the project is being delivered uh, via two contracts, um, a design bid build, which is kind of a traditional project delivery method for the bulk of the town crossing, um, and then design build for the, for the remainder. Um, having just completed a large design build project through completion of the um, Comox Valley Water Treatment Project last year, we understand that um, the vast majority of of, um, of, of workers and, and firms that are involved in and in delivery of a project of this type will be local from the island. I think we achieved 90 or 95 percent of the workforce on the water treatment project came were, were, were based on Vancouver Island. So we don't expect um, this project to be any different. And then another question about trying to narrow down time periods, and I know these are some details uh, still to come, but um, in case you do have additional information, do we do we know the time period for the work um, at the Glacier View roundabout? I think the yeah. question is around, sorry to jump in, Chris, it's around mm -hmm. the enlarged roundabout that I was mentioning earlier. Oh, my um, thank you. So unfortunately, we don't know, uh, and it's 100% uh, dependent on how the town develops and how quickly the town develops and how quickly the the area north of uh, Comox Ave and Aiken redevelops. Um, unfortunately, we don't know what that timeline is. Okay. Um, and then the next question is um, one of out of concern for businesses along Comox Avenue. And so the question is, what is being done um, to kind of address the potential impacts for those businesses during the construction period? Sure. So the, I mean, the selection of the, of the route, um, you know, of cutting down Beaufort instead of Comox Avenue was, it was kind of one of the first steps in helping to mitigate impacts to downtown businesses. So, you know, the, the majority of, um, of downtown businesses will not see the alignment run in front of, directly in front of the, of their, of their business. Um, so that being said, for those businesses on Beaufort uh, that will, that will see a frontage on, on the project alignment, um, we are guaranteeing access uh, throughout construction. Um, so from, so from that perspective, um, you know, uh, re residents and, and, and businesses will be able to, to access um, their driveways for the duration, with the exception, as I mentioned, in a couple other instances there of a two or three hours, you know, several hour block here and there with plenty of advanced notification. Um, and, and in parallel with that, we've been working extensively with the Comox Business Improvement Association. Um, so we'll be, we'll be working um, to, to uh, coordinate our, our communications efforts to ensure that um, 
you know, that uh, we're doing everything we possibly can collaboratively to ensure that people understand where the impacts are, how to get around them, um, and that downtown Comox is very much uh, still open for business. And um, yeah, that's all I got. Great. No, that's lots of good information. We are down to our final question. Um, and it is about the existing pipeline. What will happen to the current pipe when uh, construction is completed and we switched over to the new force main? So we have a we have a um, a piece of study work happening at, at this time, looking at options for how to decommission that pipe. Um, so that's being treated as a separate project. There are a couple sections, um, including. Um, the section along Bayside Road in in uh, Comox uh, IR1, which will be removed, um, but the remainder of the of the the line is likely to be decommissioned in place. Great. Okay, and with that, we have come to the end of the questions that have been posted. So, um, I thank you, Russell, for your presentation, and Chris and Craig and the panelist team for being here to help answer all of those questions. Um, thank you very much to all of the attendees for being here and, um, and asking um, for all this great information. We look forward to continuing to share updates as the project plan moves forward. Um, and again, we will be posting this recording uh, to the Connect CBRD website, uh, hopefully by the end of this week, so that you can either revisit it or share it with others who weren't able to join us today. So with that, on behalf of the project team here, I will say thanks again and sign off and have an excellent day, everybody. Thank you.